Oh, hang on. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. My name's uh, Tom Daly, and I'm going to give an intro to transhumanism um, for Reasonable Faith, for the Adelaide chapter of Reasonable Faith. Um, thank you very much for joining. And when I figure out how to get in the next slide, you've got to be kidding me. There we go. Uh, tonight, I'm going to be, or this evening, I'm going to be drawing on a couple of resources. And I, want, I want to introduce those uh, first up because we're going to cover a fair bit of science and technology this evening and a lot of biotech. And I'm not a biotech um, uh, expert by any, by any stretches. So I'm going to be drawing on the experts. Uh, one, of, one of the experts I'm going to draw on is, is Faz Rana from Reasons to Believe. And Reasons to Believe is, uh, or should be well known to uh, um, uh, people of uh, Reasonable Faith Adelaide, because we've had their, uh, is it the, uh, the uh, uh, Hugh Ross from there, I think he was the guy that uh, created Reasons to Believe, has presented here before. But Fuzz Rana is a, is a chemist, he's a biochemist. He holds a PhD in chemistry and, uh, and uh, in biochemistry and he specializes in genetics and human origins and synthetic biology he is no lightweight in the uh, biochemistry um, expertise area i'm also going to be drawing a lot on uh, a very good podcast from the uh, professor theodore ernoff who is from UC uh, University of California, Berkeley, where he's professor, professor of genetics, genomics, and, um, and all things CRISPR-Cas9. And you can see there, uh, and, and this actually, this wording here is straight from his bio at the, at the university. And he's responsible for development and, and advancement to the clinic uh, of novel approaches to treat human disease using CRISPR-based genome and epigenome editing. We're going to get into what those things are, but, but particularly for all the biochemistry stuff, I wanted you to, to see the resources that I'm drawing heavily on and see that they're actually the, they're the right people. Okay. Um, my goals uh, here are to simply raise awareness and promote dialogue and prompt questions. Uh, many times at Reasonable Faith, we're looking at history. I guess I, I've realised I tend to look at <laughs> current affairs and, um, and a future. And here we're looking at a, a real mix of both. And one that there's not very many Christian voices in. There's not very many teachers' voices or politicians' voices. And really the goal here is to start the dialogue more broadly because this stuff is coming down and in fact is already here and affecting uh, clinical outcomes, affecting trials and affect, and it's going to very, very quickly affect the way that we live and some of the, the, and we need good quality debate. Anyway, here's the agenda we're gonna follow very quickly. Uh, what is transhumanism? Uh, gene editing, CRISPR-Cas9, brain computer interfaces, radical life extension, nanotechnology, biotech, biohacking, uh, and then from all of those areas of science and tech, we're going to still look at some of the ethical issues. We're just going to scratch the surface of the ethical issues that are, that are raised by these technologies uh, and then go a little bit deeper, think about some of the philosophical and theological um, effects or what's going on in that in ph philosophical, theological realms today. And then I just got some, you know, thoughts about what we do with this. Anyway, let's go. Transhumanism. The belief or theory, theory that the human race can evolve beyond its current physical and mental limitations, especially, or actually really, um, mainly by means of science and technology. That's a, an Oxford dictionary uh, reference, uh, Oxford online dictionary reference. Trans, but transhumanism, transhumanism is actually real science. 
but there's also an encompassing philosophy or a set of beliefs that is increasingly being attached to the underlying science and technology. And transhumanists believe that we actually have, or many of them, believe that we have a moral obligation. And they're strong words, a moral obligation to take control of human evolution, to prevent suffering and overcome biological limitations, and potentially including death. And, and actually some see this as a way to avoid extinction of human life, uh, even as we transition potentially, they say, to a different species. And quoting Fazrana, and, and remember, for, for all those people and you know, those that attend reasonable faith in the flesh uh, or on Zoom real time, you know, we're, we're largely uh, people of faith. Uh, but regardless of our views, the technological capabilities to dramatically extend human life expectancy and to transcend human biological limits will soon be part of our world for better or for worse. That's from Buzz Rana, biochemist and apologist with reasons to believe. So I'm making an appeal here to not be dismissive of the stuff that's going on for particularly people of faith. So let's get into the genetic engineering, CRISPR-Cas9. Believe it or not, genetic engineering of humans has been going on for about, uh, well, over 20 years. There's actually two uh, uh, categories of cancer treatment, cancer immunotherapy, that if you are unfortunate enough to have cancer and you go to one of the, the cancer websites or to the hospital, say in Mayo Clinic or one of the online medical resources that deal with cancer, you'll see for certain types of, of cancer, they actually suggest cancer immunotherapy and it's actually gene editing. But it's not precise gene editing. It's not let's fix letter number four in you know chromosome number whatever. Um, rather, it, it, it started by in, inserting entire genes using viruses. So CRISPR-Cas9 is a game changer. CRISPR, <laughs> and we might as well define it. CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspersed Short Palindromic Repeats. And Cas9 is an enzyme that can cut DNA strands. And actually, it's a naturally occurring uh, in bacteria to fight um, virus and infection. And it's been repurposed. It was discovered in 2012 by... Emmanuel Carpentier and Jennifer Doudna, uh, for which they subsequently re uh, received a Nobel Prize in chemistry. Um, and they've modified that bacteria and been able to assemble it to do what is essentially, and I'm quoting Professor Ernov here, the guy who, who coined the term gene editing, um, it's basically control C, control V for editing DNA, think of it as, uh, you know, think of it as word processing. Now that's vastly simplifying it, but the concept is the same. You wanna be able to cut a document, insert some text, delete some text. CRISPR-Cas9 now makes that possible for DNA, including the human DNA and for editing cultured cells, stem cells, embryonic cells, and it, multiple places in a DNA strand at once. Uh, you see on the diagram on the, on the left that the um, Cas9 enzyme uh, is able to actually target, and well, there's a guide, there's some guide RNA that actually finds the regularly interspersed short palindromic repeats, i.e., it's able to be targeted at and inserted into DNA depending, it's being able to target it at certain patterns within the DNA itself, within the DNA strand itself. So, and those, you know, what's a palindrome? It begins and ends with the same letter. So we're talking about patterns of, of of genetic letters within the DNA. And it's able to identify those patterns, lock on, and then 
cut the DNA. At that point where it's cut, it can actually insert or delete genetic information. And then the human um, uh, body that, or the organic, the, the cell will actually try and repair that cut. And if the insertion or deletion is entire words, I think it is, don't quote me on that, but if the, if the, if the cut's not done right, the cell will simply die. But if the cut and the insertion or the deletion is done correctly, then the body will, or the organism will fix that cut and that edit will then be part of the cell going, going forward. I'm hoping that's making some sense, but just think about it as being control C, control V for, a, for DNA. It's not coming, it's already here. And the word cure for an increasing amount of diseases and human suffering is now being used. So in, in 2019, Victoria Gray was gene edited with Chris, CRISPR-Cas9 to actually take out the uh, genetic, um, it's a, a, what's the word I'm looking for, mutation that causes sickle cell disease. And sickle cell disease is, uh, is debilitating. It's damages, or it, it's a disease of the red blood cells where they become sickle shaped and patients suffer huge amounts of pain. And the only treatment is largely transfusions. So there have been five patients in total have been treated so far with CRISPR-Cas9 editing. They've had their DNA edited and they are, the scientists say, cured with no side effects. Now, we may say, you know, it's only two years, maybe side effects will come later on, perhaps. But the folks that are doing this are saying there's no side effects. And these guys that were having to have regular blood transfusions haven't had one since their editing. Another area that's already been going through trials and people have been gene edited is uh, a form of congenital blindness where people go increasingly blind over time. And uh, patients at the University of Pennsylvania, three, three of them were gene edited with CRISPR-Cas9 and they went from being able to detect uh, hand movements to being able to read lines on an eye chart. And yet the main uh, focus of that trial was actually wasn't, out, wasn't outcome focused, it was safety focused. Um, by the way, in my slides, I'm trying to give you all the links. And when we post both the slides and the video, um, you, can, you can actually get all the links from the video by going to the open the transcription on, on YouTube and you can search for the um, search for the URLs uh, or in the slides, you'd be able to just click on the slides. So I'm trying to, to make this very fact-based and give you all of the research and academic uh, links. So the next thing that's, that's on the list is, is HIV. And FDA just last month uh, approved the first human trials for gene editing humans um, looking to cut the HIV virus sequences using CRISPR-Cas9 and therefore disable them or potentially even kill them. I'm not really quite sure exactly how it works. But there's an alternative also being studied for HIV. During the, the AIDS crisis, particularly in San Francisco, they discovered that some people were naturally resistant to HIV. And it turns out that they have a mutation in a gene known as CCR5. It doesn't really matter to us what the gene is called, just the fact that there is a mutation. Scientists know what it is, and they can use CRISPR-Cas9 to make the same genetic information, potentially, uh, make the same genetic modification in people suffering from HIV and cure them potentially from HIV. And, and I, I'm, I'm stressing the word cure because this is what the scientists are saying. Similarly with cancer. You know, there's the, um, 
in the uh, in the trial here that I've got documented at the University of Pennsylvania, they they used gene editing to remove three genes from the DNA of a, a cancer sufferers, and those genes were ones that are known or discovered to have a cloaking effect for uh, the immune system so that it wouldn't target cancer. And then they added other genes which are known to help the immune system target the cancer and the treatment was deemed safe with, in patients with advanced forms of cancer. You know, safety there becomes a relatively interesting thing, right? But anyway, you can see the right up here, the National Cancer Institute, which is part of the National Institute of Health in the US. And essentially their quote is that this new tool, CRISPR-Cas9, has taken the research world by storm and markedly shifting the line between, is markedly shifting the line between possible and impossible. That's why I use the word cure. Um, you know, there's other, examples of it, uh, H uh, HPV virus is able to be um, modified and HPV is known to be a, a risk factor, certain modifications with HPV uh, is essentially the precursor to, or a great indication of cervical cancer. And, and believe me, that's a, that's a, Anyway, uh, that's an important, that's a really, really important um, uh, part of research. And man, we could all celebrate this, right? So, so far, this is all the easy bit. This is curing diseases and using our expertise to, to, to prevent suffering and bless people. How good is this so far, right? So let's keep tracking. Um, it looks like there's... Uh, cures for type 1 diabetes on the not too distant horizon now and this is important there are the way that diabetes is treated today is they they tried to actually get beta cells from cadavers put them into into diabetic uh, sufferers livers but you need a lot of cadavers for that and the body just kills them anyway long story short um, they're using stem cells, and I assume embryonic stem cells, that to be able to create the beta cells to implant in the liver to overcome so that diabetic can make their own insulin. But it looks like CRISPR and Cas9 can actually even take away the need for uh, stem cells because it looks like they can actually take the st st cells from the diabetic sufferer, in fact, interestingly, from their urine is what I read, and modify them so they actually become beta cells. How they stop the immune system killing them again, I don't know. But the point here is that CRISPR can take away the need for um, embryonic stem cells. That's a good thing. Um, Professor Ernov was asked on, the, on this interview, this about an hour and a half interview, what did he see next? Uh, he quipped that making predictions is hard, particularly about the future, which is uh, Yogi Berra, one of the US uh, baseball players, famous line. But he said, in saying that, here is what is highly likely in the next five to 10 years. And I don't have much visibility beyond that. He said, next is very likely that there's going to be edits for muscular dystrophy. And if anybody knows much about muscular dystrophy and that wasting disease, that's just that's just awful. So that 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 would be wonderful to see that sort of uh, uh, cures for that sort of disease. Um, similarly, edits to fix mutations in the lungs, dramatic improvements in in treating cancer, as we touched on earlier, some will likely be curable. But I'm quoting Professor Ernoff here. This is essentially his words, not mine. Uh, haemophilia and blood clotting he lists, and huge advances in the treatment of pain. So it turns out that some people have a gene that means that they don't feel pain like the rest of us. And so this is being examined to try and reduce opioid death. And the big one he, he labours on, Professor Ernoff, that is, labours on, is heart disease. There are some people, and I'm sorry, that's a really bad colour and font, 
But what it says is that some people actually lack a normal form of a gene. And those people who lack that normal form are, are vanishingly likely to have a heart, heart attack. So they're studying, can they put that gene or that modification or remove the, the normal mod, uh, gene without side effect from people who are extremely likely to have heart attacks or perhaps who have already had heart attacks. And that's in the next five to 10 years. Look, there's some technical hurdles. It's not really control C, control V. Off target effects, uptake, I won't go through them. It's just for the sake of time. Um, but, but really, the, there are some significant areas of, of research and is still early uh, with this technology. Um, but what it can already do is so powerful. But there are, there are technical hurdles that need to be acknowledged for, for going further. Let's swap now from CRISPR-Cas9 to brain-computer interfaces. We're actually already familiar with these. Pretty much everybody would be familiar with the cochlear implant, which uh, puts um, uh, electrodes or connections into the brain and into the ear, or, or deep brain uh, stimulation for, for Parkinson's, uh, for tremor and for ep epilepsy. This is they actually put in a, an electrode and they actually find out where the, the brain is actually sending the, the, the signal for the, for the tremor, for the epilepsy. And for a long time, they're able to diminish or even get rid of the, uh, the tremor and the, um, and the shaking. The electrodes eventually break down over time. But the point is we're, exist we're, we're already familiar with brain computer interfaces. What we are less, we're also familiar because we 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 watch the Paralympics, so we've seen the the runners running on on um, uh, you know on steel legs or on bionic legs. We've seen those, right? But one of the real frontiers is how can somebody who's lost a limb or who is paralysed, how can they be helped to take ownership? of that limb so that it becomes much more useful and they gain much more back of what they've lost. And there's a TED talk here that I've got listed here that honestly gave me goosebumps. What you see here is a gentleman who fell off this cliff that he's climbing up with his robotic foot. And uh, he fell off and he, he was in, a, they showed him on the TED talk um, and he's the, product of, of uh, research at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or at least the robotic foot is. And they showed him in the hospital bed with tubes and uh, he was lucky to live. He fell off this particular cliff. And they were able to build him a bionic foot that he feels as is his own. What's the key? The key is that they, did the surgery when they took off his foot so that there was still the flexor and the extensor muscles, or at least those pathways back to the brain. And then what they do is they basically have this, the circuit completed from the new bionic foot. And it was interesting. He immediately, like within a half an hour, he actually knew where his foot was. He, he was moving it left and right and up, up and down. And he knew where that foot was because he had the feedback to his brain so that it became part of him. I, I've got to tell you though, what's not captured is the human spirit of somebody going back and climbing the mountain that nearly ended their life with a bionic foot. That is so cool. I got, I got goosebumps as I was watching it and I, I made my wife watch it. It was just awesome. And if you don't do anything else from this talk, go and watch that TED talk. It's just awesome. Anyway, similarly, the locked-in syndrome, and this is where we get a bit more into the detail of, of brain-computer interfaces. This is sort of the next level. Um, the locked-in syndrome, where people can't move, we, we think there's somebody in there, but so hard to communicate. Or for people like the gentleman featured here who are quadriplegics, 
they created a brain computer interface and you can see you can see the device it's actually and it's pretty clunky i'll show you Neuralink in a minute but it's actually connected wide it's got probes into his brain many little wires are actually um, implanted into into his brain and then what they do is they actually read his brain waves why he's going to type or to write and while they're observing the brain waves they're actually teaching an AI. They're teaching an AI what brain waves correspond to what letters that he wants to produce. And then they use a neural network and some of the best AI. So then they're able to predict now from the brain wave, they hook the brain wave output to a writing device. And now all he, all he has to do is to think about what letter he wants to create and he can write. And they showed, they showed the performance of this handwriting simply by thinking. And it's, it's, quite an amazing, it's quite an amazing video. But you see the linkage between putting the, the links into the brain, the interface into the brain, then reading the brain waves, using the AI, to decode the brain waves in the external world and then do something with those decoded brain waves. Well, that's the premise of Neuralink. And those of you might remember, some of you might remember about four years ago, I think it was now, I gave a presentation on an intro to artificial intelligence. And I, Neuralink was just starting up. And I said that it was a company to watch, something that Elon Musk was, was doing. So this macaque, I can't remember his name, but this macaque uh, um, has 2,000 connections. He has a Neuralink implant. Now, a Neuralink implant is about the size of a five-cent piece, only a little bit uh, longer. And it has, I think they're fiber uh, I can't remember the technology for the actual connections. But those connections are actually fitted by a sur surgical robot. and they've fitted those 2000 connections to his motor cortex. So signals now from the motor cortex are readable. And if you go and click on this YouTube video, you'll see they're readable from your iPhone with an app. So you can actually see all the output from his brain, from his, neuro, from his motor cortex on this app. Again, artificial intelligence, map, map the brain waves to the intentions. And now, he used the AI to predict the hand movement from the brain patterns. And now he can actually play Pong and get fed without actually doing anything apart from thinking about it. I'm hoping that makes sense because the profound impact of that, uh, if it does, well, if it does make sense, you should be thinking, wow, this is pretty profound about what might be possible. Okay, a little bit more mundane, but also closer to home in Queensland. And I don't know which, uh, which university, but this was, this was actually on TV just the other day, one of the morning shows, and, and Jill taped it. But uh, for people who've lost their voice box, they've got an AI and a, uh, and a, and a computer interface that actually learns and constructs a voice so they can, from the breathing patterns, so that the person who's lost their, their, their voice box can actually still speak. And eventually they're going to give the, the person who's lost their voice back, uh, lost their voice, they're going to give them their, their original voice back. Uh, that's pretty amazing. Similarly, there's a pancreas, that, that electronic pancreas that is using AI to, to learn what glucose from the, from the brain, what glucose levels are and to be able to basically finally mat, uh, match them with the right level of insulin. Um, now, this would be moot if we can cure it with CRISPR-Cas9, but it's nice to have, it's nice to have a, a, a number of approaches. Now, with so much of this technology, it's actually so readily available. We could have a whole presentation on biohacking. What, what's biohacking? Biohacking is modifying myself, hacking my, hacking my own human animal self. 
Um, CRISPR Cas9 gene editing kits are available on eBay uh, for 169 bucks. Let's be conservative and say that's US dollars. Um, they take about two or three days to deliver, I believe. And, and they're toys. But what Buzz Rana is saying in his book, like, uh, Humans 2.0, is that for about $5,000, you can do some serious self gene editing. And in fact, there's been a couple of transhumanists who have gene edited themselves on, on stage. I've read that they sort of, one of them at least regrets that now. And I have a long time to regret it. But anyway, it's the sort of thing that's actually available and happening. But what's really interesting about this is this, this political and cultural movement that says gene editing and body enhancements should, should be democratized, shouldn't be the realm of the scientists. And this actually, I was reading just before I started here on Wikipedia now, there's a transhumanist, transhumanist bill of rights. Now, Professor Ernov has no problem with, with anybody making mods to themselves, as long as they do so in some sort of informed way. And he can see not too far away, it is similar to having Botox injections for cosmetic reasons today. And Botox is pretty deadly sort of uh, compound, uh, but he can see that you might get a hair wash for baldness and he hopes to have shares in that company. Um, gene edit your eye color, etc. Now, some of these things are genetic and kinetic genetics actually changing them. We'll get there. Uh, we're gonna talk about epigenetic genetics shortly. So anyway, some of them are genetic changes, some of them are ep epigenetic changes. Let's just briefly touch on nanotechnology. Uh, excuse me. Nanotechnology, what is it? Uh, it's basically a branch of science that deals with things that are the size of atoms. Uh, little machines, atom machines, DNA machines, Machines that can go through the human bloodstream or through human tissue because they're so small. They can be powered with magnets. They can be powered uh, with uh, our CT. They can be powered in a number of ways. And they can do amazing things right now and even more shortly. Now, nano is a billionth of a meter. And uh, I, I stole this diagram from researchers at Duke University in the US. You know, if a person is, is sort of the one meter scale, um, you go down to the ants at two millimeters, you know, you go down to microns, two microns for bacteria, 30 nanometers for a rhinovirus, and then DNA is the level of, nano, of, of, of nanometers. Another, another example that I saw, so to put this into, into perspective, is it the same orders of magnitude from a marble, a small you know, marble, to the size of the earth. So from humans down to uh, nanoparticles is the same down as a marble to the size of the earth is up in, in terms of orders of magnitude. One of the early medical uses that's being investigated for nanotechnology is very, very targeted drug delivery. And uh, on the bottom right, I have a cold fusion video on YouTube, which I highly recommend. And they show how within Stanford, they were able to reduce the plaque in the arteries of mice by about 40%. Now, if that, if that actually translates, and that's if, if that translates to humans, particularly humans of 60 years older, 60 years and older, right? The plaque buildup is the number one reason for a heart attack. Um, and if you are able to remove the plaque, you have it, potentially have a huge effect on the number of heart attacks in people. Uh, that's and the way they do it is they use carbon nanotubes. Now, a carbon nanotube, I don't know if people have heard of graphene. Graphene is a layer of carbon molecules, one atom 
wide or high. And it, it creates a hexagonal structure, one, 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 one atom high and however long you want your sheet and however wide. And what they were able to do, what scientists were able to do, is they roll that graphene up into a carbon nanotube and then they're able to put in the drugs that they wanted to deliver to this arterial plaque they are able to roll that into the carbon nanotubes, inject it into the into the patient, into the mouse, potentially the patient later on, and those drugs are then uh, delivered into the plaque cells. They uncloak them from the immune system, which then gets rid of them. Um, that's on the edge of my expertise. The important thing here is using the 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 nanotechnology to be able to get inside of our arteries and clean them out. That, that's a huge potential. In North Carolina uh, State University, they're looking to deliver cardiac stem cells in a similar way to damaged heart muscles. So when you have a heart attack, you typically get blood starvation and part of your heart dies. You never you now no longer have the heart capacity that you did before the heart attack. So nanotechnology is, is offering a, a tantalizing promise that maybe we could start rebuilding some of that heart muscle. We'll talk about stem cells shortly. And you know, there's quantum dots to treat antibiotic resistant infections. There's a huge issue and there's lots, lots more. Uh, we don't really have time to go through it. Uh, there's novel forms of pain relief coming. Um, there are risks, and sorry, I didn't finish editing this slide, um, but there are risks around nanotechnology, and they're largely around nanoparticles getting into non-desired places. Interestingly, in that mouse model for the plaque, they showed that the immune system got rid of the nanoparticles fairly fairly quickly after the uh, after delivery. And then there's nano robots. We don't really have time to get into this, but the, these nano robots actually are able to do things like sort particular atoms into different locations within uh, <laughs> within a structure. It, it seems mind boggling to be able to build things at, at, at nano scale, but in fact, there are things like nano car races, nano structures, there are nano robots that build other nano robots. And if anybody's ever heard James Tour talk, James T O U R, it's fascinating. Just Google him. He's a he's actually a messianic Jew who talks about the origin of life. And, and as a biochemist, he talks about he he builds nano robots and says, by the way, guys. There's no way that the life started from some accident. It's just no, it just didn't happen. Fascinating. If you want to, if you want to spend a good hour or two, just J uh, Google James Tour, T O U R. All right, anti-aging research. This is one of the planks of transhumanism. This might be more of why transhuman exists and than transhuman. In Ism exists as a worldview more than anything else. Our transhumanists and a growing number of scientists are regarding aging as a disease and therefore it should be curable. So therefore they're applying massive amounts of research to find a cure and biotech companies are joining in or, or many starting up, many, many startups. And, and venture capitalists are backing the myriads of startups. We've heard this, we've seen this somewhere before, right? Yeah, it's called Silicon Valley and it's called the internet and dot com and the platforms that we're using right now. It's the same sort of, it's the same sort of dynamics going into anti-aging research. Um, there's some theories of aging out there. Uh, and I'm quoting Buzz Rana here uh, in Humans 2.0. Uh, the, the, the older 
the older theory has been that our DNA just gets banged up over time from free radicals and oxidization and other mechanisms. Um, more contemporary ideas are coming around that perhaps loss or damage is to the on-off switches of our DNA. And I mentioned epigenetics before, I'm about to, to explain what epigenetics are, but epigenetic damage. Um, and there's other, other things that are starting to, to emerge as theories of ageing. And Fasrana says that a, a complete theory of ageing, if discoverable, would be a, a really important tool um, for figuring out how to slow down or even reverse ageing. Now, what's the epigenome? What's epigenomics? Just spend a couple of minutes here. Uh, the epigenome is comprised of chemical compounds and proteins that can attach to the DNA strands. So it's not the DNA strands themselves, it's the compounds and proteins that can attach to the DNA. And they will direct such actions as turning the genes within those DNA strands on or off. And if you turn off one gene, maybe you get a skin cell. If you turn on another gene or off another gene, you, you get a different type of cell. So the, then that's called gene expression. And, and the, the chemical compounds that attach to the DNA, they're called DNA markers. So DNA gets marked up with the epigenomic um, uh, information and, and uh, compounds. Look, you can see it, and we don't need too much understanding here, um, but just a couple of things that I've learned, and, and this is again from the National Institute of Health in the, in the US, but, you, but our, our DNA in our chromosome, and that, that picture up in the, uh, if you can see, um, uh, if you can see the X up on the, uh, up on the, the top of the epigenomic diagram, and you see that X is actually a chromosome. And what chromosomes are are complete DNA strands and they're rolled up. And they're rolled up around these little yellow things there called histones. And the epigenome determines how the DNA is rolled up. And you can see there, I hope you can see if it's large enough, that when it's rolled up and that gene is inaccessible, it's turned off. But when it's rolled up in such a way that the gene is accessible, then the gene is turned on. And so that's just a little, that, that's about all we need to know about epigen, epigenomics is that it's, it's separate to the DNA, but it acts on the DNA and on the genes. And this, given the epigenetic changes are very predictable, Scientists have developed epigenetic clocks. So basically they take the epigenetic markers, they do a, a test and they can tell to a very good degree of accuracy, the biological age of an organism. And in fact, in, 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 in populations, they can give very good predictions of longevity in populations, not for individuals. And, and one of the main ones is the Horvath clock. Why does this matter? Well, because if you're going to do age research, you need to know whether you're going forwards or backwards. And these DNA clocks are one of the ways that are used to know whether you can go forwards or backwards. But then there are experiments like this. The, the Harvard Medical School showed um, that it's possible to actually go backwards, make tissues and in fact eye tissues and nerve optic nerve tissues actually younger what they were able to do was they they actually gave them um, genetic compounds uh, called yamanaka factors and they demonstrated that they could actually cure glaucoma or the mouse model of glaucoma they could take a blind mouse and make it unblind. And better than that, they actually, and sorry to animal lovers out there and 
but uh, animal ethicists, anybody who's an animal ethicist who watches this, but they were actually able to crush the one of the nerves of the mouse. And then using these Yamanaka factors, um, they were actually able to restore sight to that. They were restore the optic nerve and they were actually able to restore sight to that mouse. Now, this is potentially huge significance for brain injuries and disease, but there's two factors. There's the, there's the restoring the potential brain function, making our brains younger, but there's, there's the restoring of the age. And, and they were able to demonstrate both. Similarly, uh, hyperbaric oxygen treatment is another um, a part of research or a focus of research. And they've been able to show that they can stop and even reverse the um, aging process in blood cells. And this research, as I say, is, is happening at pace. Look, the bottom right hand there, I've got this staying young. This is, this is something that popped up in my transhumanist feed um, just last week. I, I, I didn't read the full article. I, I read enough of it to know that it's actually in, in um, scientific journals. It's not, a, it's, not a media, it's not a media headline. It's actually in scientific journals and that finding enzymes which might be related to aging. In, in a lot of the anti-aging research, stem cells, embryonic stem cells feature heavily and artificial intelligence is pervasive. It's telling us where to look for what might be causing aging. And we have vast amounts of clinical and research data now that the AIs are trolling through. Again. I pointed this out, um, you know, it was it about four years ago in my, in my first AI talk and said, this is going to start yielding results. Uh, it, and, and indeed, we've arrived, it is starting to yield results where experiments are starting to, to prove out what AI was suggesting. Um, so, Fuzrana, what's the status? Look, most scientists and governments, they don't treat aging as a disease. So you can't get, you know, government funding. But remember, I said the startup funding and the venture capitalist funding is, is happening at pace. And this is Buzz Rana from, I said life 2.0. I'm, I'm sorry, this should be humans 2.0, uh, which I've read and I thoroughly recommend. Um, he says, however, a growing minority of biogerontologists ger think that we understand enough about the aging process to dramatically extend life expectancy, even without a full model of aging. Two of the most outspoken advocates are physician Michael Fossil, who I wasn't familiar with, but, but biogerontologist Aubrey de Grey, who's really the poster child for this, I'm certainly familiar with him. And that's what Faz Rana says, there's a growing minority think that we can do radical life ex uh, extension in the near term, one decade, two decades, three decades. Um, and, and Fuzz Runner goes on, and this is really important. He goes on, their ideas are based on sound scientific insights, not quackery. And the interventions they pro propose are feasible, given advances in genetic engineering, nanotechnology, and biotechnology. I think that's sobering. It, it's telling us that this is, this is happening. Uh, even if we don't just follow the money to the venture capitalists, etc. So look, in the last 10 minutes here, I think I just want to start going through what does this all mean? This is all happening. I'm hoping I've convinced you that it's happening. I'm hoping that I'm convincing you that there's lots of good stuff, uh, but we've also seen some hints that maybe it's not all good, and that's true. So restoration versus enhancement. Restoration, and some of this is my wording, so I don't blame Buzz Rana or Professor Ernov or anybody else for this. 
Restoration is therapy, restoring what was or should have been. So restoring a heart muscle or um, restoring a limb that got blown off by an IED or the cancer, cancer destroyed. Um, you know, basically healing, if you like. Enhancement, on the other hand, is improving function beyond what was or has been. And I think of I think of enhancement when I think of changing the person, not just the human animal. And that's because I think, well, anyway, we'll get to that. I hope that makes some sense, or I hope there's some clarity there between it's because it gets a little bit cloudy what's what's restoration and what's enhancement. But let's continue. Here is just scratching the surface of some of the ethical dilemmas. Look, even today, cochlear implants have eth ethical considerations. When I started researching it. I started watching deaf parents talking about how they're separated from their now hearing kids because they've had cochlear implants. And I went, wow. Well, of course, their parents want them to hear but now they're no longer part of their community. There's now a distance. And I just went, wow, that's, I'd never, real, I'd never thought. And it really, it really struck me that the kids are the, separated from their parents in a way that they wouldn't be before cochlear implants came about. Um, Brain-computer interfaces. Does or will the brain-computer interface be the driver of the human? You know, there's a, it turns out there's a whole field of academia and research called neuroethics that has actually sprung up over the last, uh, it, it's, it's reasonably new. Uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't look to see how long, but, but it's a new field of neuro, neuroethics that's actually started up. And it's fascinating. From what I've read so far, it's largely secular. Um, embryonic stem cells. Now, many of us, I think, would feel that and believe strongly that to, to create life and only to destroy it is, is, is just profoundly wrong. And then even more, what about things like equitable access to the te technologies? Will only rich people um, get these technologies, get the heart plaque removal, get the bionic limb, get the get the CRISPR-Cas9 editing. Um, and then speaking of equitable access to the technologies, if we are using stem cells, you know we're going to need a large source of human eggs. How do we avoid using poor women? Because after all, it's, it's poor women that are vulnerable for their eggs to sell them. How do we, how, in a secular world, how do we, how do we, put those protections in and why should we and then here's something really interesting if we're successful say if we're successful in the next 20 or 30 years let's say 50 years if we're successful in radical life extension for my kids 31 um, 29 27 what if now if they're going to be around and competing for jobs with their kids, when their kids are in the market, in the market for homes, for jobs, for resources, what does this do to the relationship between generations? You know, currently we have where the generation, one generation gives to the next. What happens there when we're competing for resources? Look, I'm just touching the surface, and Fuzz Rana does a great job in um, uh, in his book Humans 2.0 of teasing out many more of these issues. But there's some pressing ones. Professor Ernoff again, uh, he's working on epigenetic modifications. Now, epigenetic modifications can be, potentially they are, I'm sorry, I'm not sure, but they can be temporary. And he's collaborating with University of California, San Francisco, Carnegie Mellon University at the White House. And, and DARPA, which is the 
the uh, military uh, technology folks who brought us the internet in the first place. And, and the idea is he wants to try and protect military personnel, maybe first responders against things like dirty bombs and radiation damage, et cetera. Can they do epigenetic changes with CRISPR-Cas9 to make temporary changes for those sorts of, of, uh, of, of harms? And, and it has civilian uses as well. Um, protecting against uh, ob abdominal cancers and pelvic cancers who need for people who need radiation treatment. But here's Professor Ernov talking about germline editing. What's germline editing? It's the editing of embryos. So that instead of the genetic change being in the cells of the adult, um, it's actually in the babies and it is there going forward. It is in the human species from this time forward. This is designer babies. This is the E word, eugenics. And, and, and this is real. And this is current affairs. In fact, actually, it's even history. This is Professor Ernov, and it's worth actually just laboring on this just for a moment, even though I'm going to go a couple of minutes over time, folks. Um, it's one of those things where things are as binary as it gets. Germline editing, editing of human beings should never be allowed under any circumstances, period, end of paragraph. And that's a direct quote from him. The only potential reason why, and he continues, the only potential reason why people want to do germline editing is uh, for human enhancement. And the reason that is, should be forever banned, is we don't know how to enhance people. Now, I think this guy is a secular Jew, or he's certainly secular, he's Russian. And uh, I think that's pretty profound. We don't know how to enhance people. Now, not everybody agrees, and I'll get to that in just a moment, but actually it's already happened. Wee Chung Ki, uh, back in 2018, modified human embryos and implanted them into a woman who gave birth to twins. Those girls and their progeny forever have those edits. And if designer babies are possible, how do, we, how do we put the genie back in the bottle? And, and yeah, I'm going to say again, the E word, eugenics. And to quote Professor Ernov, and he's hostile towards what he, Zhang Ki, did. Um, and he, Zhang Ki, got disappeared by the Chinese government not long after this happened back in 2018. But the other thing that's even deeper crime is that he showed to the rogues of the world that this can be done. This has been done, it can be done. And if you remember those gene editing kits you can get on, on eBay, apparently it's not even that hard. So Professor Ernoff goes on, I'm absolutely convinced this is happening right now. There are people who are enhancing embryos, people with too much money, too much money and not enough understanding of science and not enough ethics. Well, you know, I wonder whether He Jung Ki, after he got disappeared by the Chinese government, is he working for the military now? Is he designing super soldiers? Is he, what's he doing? Is the genie out of the bottle? Most certainly. Is this pressing that we have these conversations? And absolutely. So just to finish up, transhumanists see our destiny as a human species in what science and technology can deliver. So, so it's an idea that is going to be the most influential idea in the next several decades. This is Fazrana speaking. And will, will, and will really shape the world we live in particularly as our world becomes more and more secular. You know people are going to turn increasingly to science and technology as a source of salvation. So it's an idea that, again, is kind of the fodder for science fiction, but it's becoming a reality. And yes, it's a secular salvation story. And yes, it plays very, very well with our kids. They don't necessarily know it as transhumanism yet, they just know it as science and te technology solving our problems. As Fazerana points out, the really good news is here, there's a huge apologetic. 
are here, which I could basically do another talk just on the apologetic aspects of transhumanism. But I just wanted to give an intro today. The good news is, this is unavoidably raising fundamental questions of purpose, value, eternity, and salvation. In our rich, comfortable West, that gives us things to discuss. But ideas have consequences. And at the moment, the voices in this science and technology are secular materialists. Um, you know, people who, like Peter Singer who think that humans differ just in degree from animals. You know, he's famous for saying, oh, he, he didn't know that, that he would go and save a, a child, a human child, if it meant the life of 200 pigs. He also claims and teaches in his Princeton ethic classes that you should be able to you know, kill a human child a number of months after it's born if it's got a disability, because after all, um, you know, it's, it's not sentient. So, so he simply applies value to people according to their sentience. He's very consistent with it, by the way, and I, I do appreciate his consistency. But you can see the dangers as we're starting to talk about transhumanism. Um, here's Julian Savalescu from the Oxford Centre for Ethics. Parents have a responsibility to select the best children they could, have given them, uh, given, given them all of the re relevant genetic information available to them, have a responsibility to design a babies. Centre of Ethics at Oxford. Um, you know, but what is the purpose of, human, of humans in a transhumanist world? It's unclear. And maybe that value is, and the purpose is non existent. And certainly, transhumanists feel that as human animals, we are currently free to make any modifications we want. Influence. Look at the influence from the secular, anti theist, utilitarian consequentialists, right? They're influencing our culture via our media, our sports, our lawmakers, our schools, our HR departments, and our church and even our churches, even our churches. Think of the progressive church and think of some of the ways that some of this is already touching. Um, and of course, via the culture, our kids, our teens and our communities. Um, and on the other side, we've got folks like Professor John Lennox, and I thoroughly recommend his book, 2084, where he takes on folks like Yuri, Yuri Naval Harari, Yuval Noah Harari uh, with Homo Deus, you know, man god, uh, man god. Uh, folks like Ray Kurzweil. Oh, I should just mention before I finish up, you know, the Neuralink, they, I told you it's a, about five cent piece and it's, uh, and, it, and it's very, very uh, small, uh, implemented by, implanted by a robotic surgeon. Elon Musk sees this as the antidote to the singularity. If you think back to the AI talks where I talked about where AI could become smarter than, than um, us and that might have existential dangers. So Elon Musk sees Neuralink, yes, as curing paralysis and doing lots of good things, but he also sees it as a way for us to merge with machines. And he wants to have great bandwidth for us to merge with machines and to have two-way communication, not just one way. Anyway, um, I'm going to finish up with a call to action. I just really love it if folks who are here this evening or uh, who might have come across this talk to engage with the resources of LinkedIn. Um, and, and particularly for us, those of us of faith to encourage young Christians to get into science and tech, consider careers there. You know, the church, we are the, the church. It's not inside the building. So we, we really need to get the yeast to go all the way through the loaf, if you like, and to start influencing our culture by being able to be part of these conversations. And there's a whole lot of fodder to start talking to young people because a lot of them are a lot more along across this and, than people of my generation. And, and just encourage other, other believers to engage as a way to be relevant and, and seek the, the, the betterment of our city. If, if, we're, if we're currently in exile in our sector, secular culture, 
we're supposed to, according to Jeremiah, seek the welfare of the city, right? And, and use the gospel to show how these transhumanists, this science and technology, where it makes sense, where, we, where the material ends and where purpose and teleology actually start. And uh, remind ourselves that there's nothing really to be afraid of for us Christians because the Christian faith is a long tradition of learning. And as folks of faith, there's nothing to be scared of that isn't in Christ's control, right? And that's the end. I've got a few more resources, stuff to, to post. Thank you very much. Um, for, sorry, I went a little bit overboard. I hope it was worth your while. Um, right. Thank you very much, um, uh, Tom. And could you unshare your screen, please? I'm doing that right now. There right. Uh, so um, everyone feel free to uh, unmute mute your microphone if you'd like to speak. Um, uh, first of all, I'll, I'll just um, try and quickly go through the um, um, chat comments. Um, first one's from uh, Brian. Using science and technology to evolve humans into something greater reminds me so much of Dr. Hugh episodes where they in <laughs> upgraded humans into Cybermen. Do you want to add anything to that? Well, actually, oh, thank you very much. Oh, sorry, Brian. I don't need very much to that one. I think if you've seen those Dr. Hugh episodes, it's uh, reasonably obvious. Yeah. All right. Um, for, me, for me, you mentioned Control C and Control V. How about Control X? Yeah. <laughs> I was actually oh. trying to think of whether there was a more accurate um, analogy there. And so, is it is it that um, every the DNA in every cell gets edited, or at least a working majority of every cell in your body gets edited uh, to, to be the new values? No, no, I, I skipped over that in the interests of time. Um, but it depends on what cell type is and what their genetic engineering package where the CRISPR editor is packaged into. So Professor Ernov uh, talks about um, the eye you've actually got to eject the editing package into the eye. And he's saying they do have reasonable control about how far that genetic, uh, that editing package actually spreads. And it's not the gene that divides and, 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 then, and then propagates the edits in, in mature humans. Uh, it's actually the editing package that is actually propagated. Um, in, the, in the liver, which you saw, um, that's gonna be more for the blood sickle cell, uh, you can just inject the editing package into the uh, into the bloodstream that's targeted for the liver, and the scientists have a way, and it accumulates in the liver, and, and it does its magic in the liver. Did that answer yeah. the question? Yeah, my my question was control X. It means delete. You cut, yeah, but yes. you can, can cut. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. Yes. Yeah, it's, so, it's so insertion, did... it's insertion and deletion and modification. Yes. Right, okay. Uh, Stephen, as a sufferer of type 2 di diabetes, I think the organ that produces insulin is the pancreas, not the liver. So th that was just a correcting comment. So yeah, yeah, very, very small one because later on, uh, Tom, you did say, yeah, pancreas is what produces insulin. So I think it might have just, because you've been talking about sickle C or whatever, um, the liver was on your mind and it's actually pancreas. I hope I didn't say the pancreas is where the insulin was. Sorry, I hope I didn't say the, the liver I hope I didn't say that, Stephen. I believe what I said was that they could actually put the top, the beta cells into the liver. And indeed, that's oh. where that they don't try and put them back into the pancreas. They actually put them in the liver. It Did turns they? out that oh. the pilot cells can actually live in the, the liver. So the technique is to actually put them back into the liver, even though normal human beings are in the pancreas. And in type 1, it's the pancreas islet cells that are killed by the immune system. So you're exactly right. I hope I didn't say the right, the wrong thing, uh, but well, look, thanks for correcting it. Well, no, 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 look, it, it, it's a small comment and I'm nothing more to say. So. Um, okay. Uh, Brian uh, Schroeder, when genes are deliberately modified to mitigate problems, e.g. potential for heart attack, what other effects do these modifications have? After all, the normal state was like that for a reason. So, so two comments to that. One is... You know, I skipped over that thing about there's lots of technical hurdles. <laughs> I did skip over that, but this, it's not as easy as control C, control V, right? Um, 
<laughs> there's a bit more to it. Um, and there's a, there's a few fairly significant issues to get over. One of which is off target effects. I mentioned that one, right? So, so yeah, if you, if you actually have off target effects, that's, that's going to be problems. Um, also of situations like in Africa, sickle cell anemia gives people resistance to a particular parasite. So for them, it's an advantageous mutation, yes. although yes. it is in fact really a bad thing. Yes. And that, that actually is discussed a bit in the, in the literature. And these are the things that they're actually, these are why genetic uh, clinical trials and things are going uh, so carefully. That's why we're talking about mouse models. Um, and, uh, and I think you'll find that those five people that were gene edited for sickle cell, I think they're all African-Americans. So, so that's, you know, that makes sense, right? But yes, you're, you're exactly right. That's, that's one of the, it's one of the gating factors where a lot of the research dollars are going is what are the other effects? But, but there are some where it's known, say the AIDS situation, where, where somebody has a, or lacks a, a mutation in a particular gene. And because of all the work in genetics and epigenetics and the mapping of the human genome, right? Uh, it's pretty well known what those sorts of people are and have and what disease they may or may not, you know, what are their susceptibilities and, and what are, you know, what are the effects? Similarly with heart, with the heart, I mean, you know, Somebody's got a, 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 a mutation that gives them vanishingly small chance of getting a heart attack. Does that work in combination with other mutations they have to stop other things happening? They're the questions being asked. Absolutely. Mm. Um, and a comment from Stephen. If someone undergoes CRISPR-9 change to their DNA, do they pass that correction on to their offspring? I'm hoping that after 723, that became very obvious I when we started so. talking about germline editing. And yes. Yes. yes, you you did answer that question later. Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, but um, germline's different. You're actually changing the embryo. Yeah, that's but uh, but uh, um, for Casper nine, you like that you if you say you uh, had sickle cell cured, and then you had kids after that, would that be passed on? No. What? No. No. Oh, okay. No, oh, because okay. that, that's what I was explaining to Eric just a minute ago, is that uh, the what's passed on with, say, if you and I got gene edited, right, our cells don't divide and pass on that edit in the divided cell, right? Mm. They, they, they actually have to target the new divided cell with the gene editing package. So in fact, that was one of the, that's one of the, the question marks is, will we have to redo the edits? Well, it don't all those cells regenerate every seven years or something like that? Then Well, it depends on what sort of cells, some are long Yeah, yeah. So, so wouldn't the, does that mean that the effect is temporary? Uh, this is, well, so far it's been two years and they haven't had to re-gene edit the, the lady who was cured of sickle cell. So it's an unknown. Uh, okay. Um, uh, Eric Love, as a coder, I don't usually get it right first time, plenty of trial and error. So what are you saying from that, Eric? Um, yeah, so um, in software, depending on how mission critical uh, your project is, you have to be careful about when something's ready to release or upload or, or um, yeah, put in the user's hands. And so with gene editing, um, so, and and with, with most software, you're testing things on your own machine or if it's for hardware, you've got a simulating system so you can test it on the simulator before you're using real machines that cost lots of money. And likewise, um, uh, if, you, yeah, if you edit your own genes or, or the genes of a person and it does them harm, um, that's something you want to avoid. Um, and so, yeah, be very careful or have or have some kind of uh, testing environment? Um, yes, it's called my, well, by the way, there are most of our, most of our drugs and our 
um, uh, medical discoveries aren't done in the lab. They're done on computer. Um, and I was fortunate enough to work with a number of the gene technology companies down in San Diego when I lived in the US. And I was staggered by how much compute power they chewed up and the way they did things. But the reality is it's so much cheaper to throw computing power and programmers at uh, and data uh, and, and AI and machine learning now at a problem way before you ever try to synthesize a compound or to try and perform um, a, uh, any sort of uh, molecule or, or, or experiment in the lab. So the first thing that most of the genetic companies are doing is using computers. But then the next thing they're doing is they're using you know, mouse models and animals, right? So again, sorry to the ethicists out there. And um, Eric, you also uh, um, pointed about something that was drawn 12 years ago. What do you mean by that? Well, that's, that's just a funny comic um, talking about the, um, the biohacking side of things. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, don't laugh. People have got um, Bluetooth and, uh, yeah, yeah it's, they're, they're called grinders. There's a whole subculture out there that, that people are basically editing themselves. My friend was, was talking about that and, and was um, liking his vasectomy to, to that scene. Yeah, well, um, yeah, I guess that's end of life for that version anyway, right? <laughs> All right, moving on. Uh, Bronwyn, <laughs> uh, did I use um, gene editing now on embryos? If, um, if so, could we see that someday conditions like Down syndrome being edited out? Um, you kind of addressed this, didn't you? Yeah. I think I, think I did. Yeah. I think I did. That's exactly... I've seen, I've seen a few... Um... Uh, articles and I think it was on the ABC recently talking about um, Down syndrome and the dilemma between uh, the pressure that parents get put under if their child is supposedly being born Down syndrome and then um, uh, and then those parents who have Down syndrome children and the how much they love them and you know the value their lives and how yeah. they've changed them and so if you're faced with the ethical dilemma I think with you know is does it what the value of a human life, um, and I think you touched on this later, Tom, anyway, but, you know, like, is someone's um, life less valuable because they've got Down syndrome? Mm. And then, well, should we edit it out? And that is that the parents, you know, is it a, like you're saying, the pressure is from the science community is to edit it out, then... Um, I, I think, I don't know, I know so think about the, the diagram I drew, with how the, the, the utilitarian voices like Peter Singer. So Peter Singer lectures on exactly this and writes about it in Practical Ethics uh, uh, in, in Princeton. Mm. And he basically says that, look, it's not the mum's fault that she, found, that she didn't find out in utero that her kid um, uh, had Down syndrome. So she should be given a couple of months to be able to kill the kid after it's born. This is what he lectures on. And I, and, I, and I think this is a real opportunity for um, doing a biopsy of culture, mm. as Mark John Comer would call it. Let's, let's start. You know, we, we've had this conversation, actually, Ronald. Um, we, 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 we get Christian faith biopsied all the time, right, and critiqued yeah. and everybody. Well, let's, mm. let's start critiquing Richard Dawkins, who mm. made exactly the same comment about Down's babies. Let's start critiquing and pulling on the threads of the non-Christian worldviews and on the threads of our culture. And I think this science, this area of science and tech, because it's so profound and touching such profound areas, yeah. we can use it to start those conversations and go, really? Let's, let's go and find somebody who's got a down skin. I mean, just, just go and tell them they're not worth yeah. being in this world. Really? Yeah. Well, you know? I know, yeah. Yeah. Um, Tom, do you believe that people like uh, Peter Singer uh, say, say things that are worthwhile and valuable that we should be taking on? I, I do, I do. Peter Singer is very consistent with his with his with his um, philosophy, um, thinking that where when you when you give human beings preference, then we're guilty of speciesism 
just like um, just like we would be of racism, um, or and um, and he, I was listening to him talk on a transhumanist uh, podcast the other day, and, and and it was interesting. He was saying, "Oh, you know, if there's something better than the human species, if we could move." And we could stop, say, factory farming animals. Like if it meant that mankind was no longer here, right? But we stopped the, all the suffering of, of all the, the factory farmed animals, then maybe it'd be a good thing if human beings weren't here. So he, he's consistent with his with his uh, utilitarian ethic. And to the point where he also claims that he gives about a third of his salary away. It probably does a bit more than a lot of Christians tithing, right? So I, I like his I like his consistency, but he goes wrong very early with the fact that he values life only in terms of its sentience. Mm. Mm. I agree with you very strongly about supporting his consistency. There are so many others who come from the same basic premises and yet refuse to follow them through theological conclusion. They just try mm. to ignore and overlook. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, 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 I like his consistency, and you know? I agree with some of the things that he says about climate change, and and some of his 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 uh, uh, oh, what do you call it when you give uh, uh, what's the word philanthropy philanthropy yeah some of his philanthropy is actually yes I think it's laudable I just wish he had better reasons and and um, and I I wish he I wish he I wish he drew bigger circles that would also encompass those people with downs and uh, the value of, of people being greater than that of animals and other sentient life forms. Mm. But again, you, the question you can of, make a good movie about it, really. I mean, it's like pick the, pick the I mean, it's the common, isn't it? It's like pick the white, you know, male <laughs> child over the someone else child like it's 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 so obvious that it's like a like you say it's um choosing one race over another and it's not race it's a top of human you know but also then um could you argue that you could reduce abortion by by making the edits before there's a life to be killed or not mm. Mm. With respect, most of the abortions are not about the viability of the baby. It's the convenience factor. I don't want to have a baby. It'll spoil my life choices. Uh, I'll have it killed. I mean, we don't say they use the word termination, um, but it's a euphemism. We all know it means killing. Anyway, moving on. Um, Stephen, you made a comment about Stepford Wives. I know nothing about this. Please okay. inform me. Well, for those that may not have seen it, it <laughs> actually was a... A movie, what, 15, 20 years ago, which actually almost touches on this. Um, a couple move into this uh, a community, an enclosed community, where everything is perfect. Mm -hmm. And then they find that all the women are so, well, they do everything perfect. And in the end, you realise they're, I, I can't even remember the, the, the background, the detail, but apparently they've all been gene edited and they're perfect wives. So perfect that it's, it's a, almost a horror movie. Mm. Mm. <laughs> um, okay, uh, Eric Love on Isaiah 65. Um, would you like to talk to that? Um, I just just when Tom was talking about it, I thought of I thought of that verse that that talks about uh, people living a long time. Um, uh, and so, yeah, there's perhaps some some fulfilment of prophecy there, although there's that's probably not the main uh, thing it's predicting. But I guess I also thought of um, uh, later on, uh, Tom, you asked uh, what's going to happen if we're living for hundreds of years and, um, and then saying and arguing, well, we're asking what's, what's um, enhancement and what's restoration. And, um, and then if we, if we read uh, early Genesis as, if if people were living that long then is that is actually long lives uh the way god made us to live that seems to imply that um a long life is a good thing doesn't it mm. um all right uh stephen 
My dad was given a pacemaker at 76. Do you like to comment on that? Well, yes. For those, yes. He was given a pacemaker at 76. His physical health, the heart, wasn't too flash. He lived for another 13 years, but for almost half of that, he had dementia. So I guess the point being, sure, we may be able to do a lot of stuff, particularly the uh, physical uh, our physical health, but dementia is that, uh, what's the right word, the elephant in the room. Um, how do we know how much plaque has been getting on our neurons so that we may end up regretting our extended physical life when our mental um, state gets down, right down, and we don't know who we are. So, so two things to say about that is that, uh, yeah, you know, I, I only just touched on the ethical and the concerns, right? I just, it's a mere scratching the surface. We could have a whole, but, but, you, but you couldn't have the conversation about ethics until you've actually got some level playing field about where we are with the science and tech, right? And, and with transhumanism. So tonight's just an, an intro to transhumanism and the science and tech. Yeah, and look, Tom, I fully agree with that. And that's what I, I you know, yeah, you so hit the nail right on the head. But I guess my comment is, it's one thing to have, uh, what's the right word, healing of parts of our life. Mm. But we may well, may well find there are other parts of our human capability, particularly our brain, which is obviously probably the most complex organ we have, where it may well go down, even though they're able to fix other parts of us. So, so there are two things. That was the first thing that would to say was that you know I couldn't really go into too much of that tonight. And you're right; it's much deeper. And 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 you bring up a great example, right? But that is also one of the nearer term focuses of the anti aging. Mm. Is that even if we don't get radical life extension? It's to actually have a more fit and healthy life. Mm. Think about somebody who doesn't have to live with the with the thirty or forty percent um, uh, degraded heart function. Yeah. Um, but brain computer interfaces. I dropped this slide out. It might be in the resources at the end when I post them. But in fact, one of the things that Fazrana talks about is some research that looks to shunt um, a brain computer interface that, that actually shunts. Uh, short-term to long-term memory, which is one of the things that happens in 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 dementia, is that that short-term never gets stored in the in the in the longer term. And they think they understand enough now where they could use AI so that they could actually have the right inputs to long-term to actually do the data storage into the long-term memory. How realistic is that? I don't know. But your point is really valid, Stephen. Is that that that's at living well as well as living longer living mm -hmm. healthier living more active is almost the the primary goal of the aging project and the extension is the second one mm. and in particular it's the behavior patterns that change my dad it was very sad and he'd um he went into operation he was ex-serviceman went into operation at one of the uh, repat hospitals woke up very angry, very aggressive. Uh, I now know that he was, well, certainly had a very horrible upbringing with a, a stepfather who used to whip, uh, whip him and his uh, brothers. And it's as though the, whatever it was, suddenly the memories were released and he became, changed his whole character. And I don't know that anything they could do to the brain cells could ever fix the, uh, that, you know, almost like PTSD. Yeah. suddenly came swelled up from his memory banks. Mm. I'm learning Greek yeah. at the moment and um, I have trouble remembering my uh, vocab because my brain leaks. Can I uh, get a cure for that? <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, I, I think, Stephen, your comment in this conversation touches on something really, really at the core of the ethics and the philosophy. If mm. we are just animals, if there's no difference in, in kind yes. but only degree, right then and with there's nothing but material then what you're saying about character and morality i mean it it, it it doesn't matter right but in fact actually if we are different yes and if character and relationship and 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 all that matters yes. then then there is nothing that i've spoken about tonight that actually touches on that or recognise it and how can you care for that? Yes. How can you care for something 
How can you make sure you don't damage something that you don't think exists? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a question from you talked about enhancement versus uh, was it reversion or something? Uh, restoration. Uh, restoration. Um, like, could you? It would it be possible to enhance athletic performance through? Yes. Yes. I I wonder if Lee Jung Ki has actually been. Uh, I, I look, don't don't start conspiracy mm. theories, um, but but look, the guy who actually gene edited the. Uh, the embryos that then were two baby girls, um, you know, we know something about growth, uh, mm. where the growth um, genes are, where the some of the strength, where some of the um, memory things are. We know en enough uh, to start playing around in those areas. Well, you know, could you enhance for athletic performance? Perhaps that's happening right now. Mm. Yeah, well, it would just add to a current problem like things could, like could steroids. You, mm. Could you? Absolutely. That's the yeah. point that yeah. Professor Ernov was making in labs well, around you've just the got world. To look at athletes. Happens. You've just got to look at athletes like um, most of the fastest runners in the world are black, right, because they have faster twitching muscles. So if you're gene editing, you'd be getting black twitching muscles in placing them where in the, you know, in the genetic makeup. So yeah. it'd yeah. have to be possible. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Uh, from David, uh, the access to therapies we already have is far from equitable. Would you like to talk on that? You have to unmute. You got unmute, David? I think he's trying. <laughs> got it. Wait, um, I think it speaks for itself. But, you know, um, Every time we get more full of ourselves and think it's um, reasonable to spend vast sums of money enhancing our lives, we uh, at the same time forget people whose lives could be greatly enhanced by a very small expenditure and very relatively low tech stuff. Mm. But um, that, that's part of what you, you're talking about, Tom, that um, we have a hierarchy of importance for people based on all kinds of. Um, wrong criteria. Mm. Yeah, I just think it turbocharges the problem. It, it, it has the potential to turbocharge the problem and, and exacerbate it. That's all. Mm. Okay, we finished with the chat comments. Just uh, feel free to uh, ask any questions or make any comments. Mm. Um, my, my comment, you touched on it, was the. Uh, expectations um, with the rapidness and the expectation rising it creates a major political problem who gets to the front of the queue mm -hmm. and is it just the rich or is it those that adhere to a poli political party that uh, yeah. in some countries that's very important all those issues are on the back burner and i can see it could actually increase a lot of tension in countries mm -hmm. the haves and the haves not Many years ago, it was food, but now it's going to be access to all this technology that will be the haves and the haves not. Um, yeah, it's a big, that's the whole equitable issue and who gets access to what. And particularly if we start editing ourselves, uh, you know, uh, and maybe there's a good side of this because some maybe, you know, can you imagine the money freed up if we can get rid of that arterial plaque? How many heart attacks won't we have? Mm. Um, so maybe, you know, it's not necessarily bad news here or around in terms of equity. Mm. It's just that there are a lot of questions about equity that get raised and some that get really turbocharged. Mm. Most billionaires are at risk of getting old. And so there's going to be plenty of funding for all of the above. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to put cryogenics in here as well, but I, the cryogenic in industry is also looking like it's just really, really taking off. And somebody pointed out that there's so many now that if actually we get, if it turns out that we actually get technology that can bring them back, we might have a real issue. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 
Do you, do you think there's any viability in cryogenics? You have that's basically freezing your body, and then uh, I, I didn't. I didn't do enough research. Yeah, okay, I, fair enough. I, I just went. I just went too much already. I yeah. already went five minutes over time. And the problem is, I create a slide and want to tell people something. Mm. It's really hard for me to colour. So if I put any more in, I wouldn't. Have, you know, it wouldn't have been good. Yeah, it's called the sin against the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. Yeah. I don't know. Let me ask some questions then, Kevin. Was yeah. Was that interesting and news to to people? Was that was that yeah? We've seen all this before, or was this some of this actually made you go, "Wow, that's closer than I thought." Is mm. anybody only ninety percent? Definitely. <laughs> well done, Tom. I really appreciated that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you know your topic well mm, comes through. Very helpful. Yeah, for me, for me, it was uh, 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 virtually everything you said was new. I, I had no idea about the background. Right. Mm. The things we didn't know, there was plenty more that you added into it to expand on. Mm. Yeah, the CRISPR-Cas9 is the, is the current game changer. Um, just keep your eye on that. Mm. When you see when you see headlines on those, click on them and just have a quick. Quick look that, that's going to be it's like everything tom it's like this cutting edge stuff is such it's got such value and can be so life-changing and so for so many people and so, such a blessing and then it has this downside to it you know so um it's yeah like you say we're going to get more people involved um uh from i suppose from a christian point of view or an ethical point of view that got because there's obviously a lot of um other people out there that might not have a faith, but do have an ethics. And um, they were, like you said, they were against um, using it for um, enhancement, you know, so. Mm. It, 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 it's, um, there are so few Christian voices, and this is Fazrana from Reasons to Believe. This is why he wrote the book and he's doing mm. podcasts and, and, uh, uh, mm. and uh, going around and just trying to get Christian thinkers and Christian scientists communicating and raising awareness about what's going on in the culture around us. Mm. And um, because it's affecting our kids and grandkids and it's mm. affecting them through, mm. through culture and technology. Mm. Well, I, I found it encouraging that like, it's not mainly bad. There's a lot, most of it sounds yeah. pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. There's some huge risks, but there's mm. some huge potential blessings, right? Yeah, mm. absolutely. I mean, hell, you know, I have a type one diabetic son, right? I it, it's really wonderful for me to sit here thinking that he's likely not to have to live with that all of his life. Mm. That's that's really comforting. That's mm. that's I feel like that's a gift. Um, and I'll be honest with you, it was really hard to. I thought about taking out the slide on HPV virus and um, and uh, cervical cancer because there's a young lady I know that died of that two days ago and it's been tragic. Mm -hmm. If we could lose that particular disease, I'm sure the planet would be much more like like thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that was not part of the original plan. Mm -hmm. um, can I <clears throat> sorry? Can I say from my philosophy, bioethics background. You've stirred all sorts of thoughts here and I've got notes on both sides and I don't know which bits to talk about. But <laughs> I think one of the biggest problems for our society is that you can't have an agreed bioethics or ethical system until you've got an agreed meta-ethic. And our whole postmodern world is against a better anything mm -hmm. across the whole community. Yeah. So I don't think we're ever going to get any consistent attitude to any of this because the the secular world has no scripture to he, keep anything to a stable base or a stable belief system and utilitarianism has a whole lot of varieties and changes on what you think what the people involved think is a utility and what's worth going for mm -hmm. so there is no meta ethic and there is no guarantee of anything stable at all into the future 
as I've seen even with the um, control of drugs, because I started medical school with the thalidomide disaster. I saw the whole control system built up mm -hmm. to have controls on that. I lived through the HIV, AIDS, gay community pushing this emergency registration where the science was all still done. And that's all been abandoned in this present COVID chaos. Um, there's no, nothing being properly measured. And if you're not measuring, then you're not doing science. The whole attitude to everything has changed so much that it's galloping way ahead of any scientific control. I only partially argue with that. Um, CDC have given up some of it, and, and I don't want to get, I thought about getting into vaccines and I thought, no, I'll stay away from that. Um, so let me just um, say that I, I only, what you're saying there is only half accurate. I've been looking at the TGA and the RAGCP and following a lot of their stuff. A lot of the countries around the world are actually doing it. But you're right, right at the moment, the CDC, for some reason, aren't actually monitoring and collecting data like they were. And I don't really understand that. I am trying to understand that. Well, the initial requirement was not for the CDC to follow it. The manufacturer of a new agent, and because I got put on medical research committees as the ethicist, I tried to tell the health department I found ethics the most boring part of the philosophy. And they said, well, you're the only doctor with a philosophy degree, so you're it. Um, <laughs> um, Oh, I've forgotten where I was going with that. It, it, anyway, I agreed with what you said about an ethic. Like, who's ethic? Um, and and uh, who, how in the hell... When there is no... When there is no consensus of virtue mm -hmm. or what virtues... What, cons, uh, what, can, uh, what um, entails virtue within a society... How in the hell do you get agreement on ethic or then uh, moral questions? And the answer is you don't. Yeah, but people still vote and politicians make decisions. They may not be good. <laughs> Correct. You have It basically defaults to power, and that's exactly what Nietzsche said. It's a, basically a will to power. Which is developing. Oh. Anybody's free to speak. Well, one of the things about whether it is available for the rich is that there is a system in America where with new research medications, it's offered to the rich at a huge fee. And what the rich are paying for is to pay for more, re uh, for more research. So it's not just that they get it first, they actually pay for extending the research. And it's quite a considerable extra fee that they pay for all of that. That's that's one of their standard methods of paying for medical research. So you're saying that can be a good thing? Oh, it is. Hmm. The rich are paying whatever they're doing with their tax system. When they go for these systems, they pay a lot extra for the medical research on that problem. Hmm. Yeah, well. Thanks, Tom. It was really good. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. At this point, I'll uh, stop the recording, but uh, stay online if you'd like to for uh, open discussion.